a welcome to the people who have joined us. This will be our monthly coffee chat on this time, advances in the industrial internet of things. Uh, good morning, everyone. This is, I think, the ninth coffee chat organized by the uh, integrated digital solution part of the digital energy technical section of the Society of Petroleum Engineers, CPE. Um, we've been doing this since May of 2021 with a succession of uh, guests. Um, in an earlier coffee chat, we had Dan Isaacs, who's the CTO of the Digital Twin Consortium. And today we have the pleasure of having Stephen Mailer, who is the CTO of the Industry IoT Consortium, another part of a conglomerate of consortia called the Object Management Group. Uh, my name is Claude Baudouin. I am a consultant who's member of the aforementioned SPE organization. I am also actually affiliated with the Industry IoT Consortium. Syed uh, is, uh, is also here to participate in, in moderating this, Syed Abdullah Habib. Stephen, I'm going to turn it over to you to introduce yourself. And then Stephen has a couple of slides to show to start the conversation, to set the context. You will tell me when to advance and we will proceed. Uh, thank you very much, Claude, and thank you everyone else uh, for organizing it and, of course, attending. Uh, I'd like to begin with a short, I hope short, uh, bio of myself. I took one of the first computer science degrees in the UK. Uh, my first job was at the uh, at CERN, the uh, European Centre for Nuclear Research in Geneva, uh, where I spent some time on what is now the Large Hadron Collider, a bunch of other things. Uh, it's gone through several iterations. Uh, but it's the same basic ring uh, in which they are accelerating the various goodies. And then I moved uh, to Berkeley where I worked uh, with uh, another accelerator center and ran the real-time systems group. I've been involved in real-time and embedded systems for a long time. And this is going to sound as if it's a part of the bio, but it's actually needed to help us understand uh, where we're going in this story. Uh, at that time, of course, there are a lot of different systems and they are not connected to the Internet. They are doing their own thing. They are controlling and at, uh, at Lawrence Berkeley Lab, they were controlling uh, accelerators. I worked on a project, Bay Area Rapid Transit, not connected to the Internet, none of that stuff. Every single project, Tokamak, whatever, uh, is not connected to the Internet. Over time, actually, I moved into doing a lot of work in telecom, which of course is the internet, and we did a lot of work there. In 1985, uh, I established a small company, Project Technology, uh, with the goal of making uh, uh, software development rational, controllable, and predictable. That story, I suppose, ended 21 years later uh, when I became a signatory to the Agile Manifesto, uh, which many people tend to regard, given my history in terms of modeling the unified modeling language which is a product of the object management group and so on i uh, found my uh, sig signature on that manifesto to be somewhat strange but in fact it makes a lot of sense and it makes a lot of sense because it's all about being careful taking small steps delivering the most value over time uh, i worked in a larger company and then uh, finally uh, ended up here as an employee of uh, the object management group uh, running the IAC program. Uh, Dan Isaacs, whom Claude mentioned earlier, uh, works for me as another program that we have. That's why the second line uh, on my bio here. So if I could go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Here are a bunch of names that people use. Um, we called ourselves the Industrial Internet Consortium way back in 2014 when we were founded. Uh, that term actually did not catch on. It was a term invented by GE. Uh, the term that really caught on, the two terms I think that have caught on the most are Industry 4.0, which is a uh, initiative of the German government uh, to improve manufacturing in Germany, although in fact they have offices in Shanghai, so, which doesn't seem to me to be a German city, but never mind. Uh, of course, the Internet of Things, IoT, is very popular. Uh, cyber physical systems is a peculiar word invented, I believe, by the National Institute of Science and Technology. Uh, in the US, uh, 
I actually participated in a panel, a uh, virtual panel for IEEE a couple of months ago, uh, where there was a discussion about whether cyber physical systems were different from uh, the Internet of Things. And one thing that I realized right at the very end of that discussion uh, was that people were assuming that IoT was only gathering data and not actuating anything. And that's where the industrial Internet of Things comes in. Uh, the industrial Internet of Things is, to my mind, exactly the same as the cyber physical system and a subset of the more global Internet of Things. And the characteristic there that differentiates it from uh, IoT in general is that you do, in fact, activate things, you change the world. Uh, mechatronics is another word a bit made up, like cyber physical systems, China 2020, Robot Revolution Initiative, Industrial Value Change Initiative, Agence du Futur. Uh, all of these are names of organizations rather than uh, technologies. Now, the reason that this slide is here is that I wanted to bring forward the idea that what's happening here is a progression in different ways and, of course, in different names, because every time there's a new initiative, you've got to make a new name, you've got to differentiate it from the old one. It's just the marketing thing that people do. But essentially what we're doing here is and have been doing slowly over time is connecting things to the Internet. And that to me is what the industrial Internet of Things is all about. It is a classical standard everyday ordinary boring control system except for one tiny thing and that is that it is connected to the internet now with that comes great opportunity uh, in particular you can do things like uh, look at different oil wells and see why this one appears to be performing better than that one even though the circumstances appear to be exactly the same what is different well you can measure uh, your different instruments uh, across the different, uh, if you like, a fleet is a common term in manufacturing or in automated vehicles, a fleet of oil wells, and determine why this one is working better than that. You can also do things like uh, predictive maintenance. Again, you can do that individually on a single site, which is air gaps not connected to the rest of the world. Uh, but by comparing it to others, you can learn more. Over time, you can also, of course, get to the point that you can have new business models. Um, I live in Southern California, in the summer anyway, and I don't have a car. Now, I recognize that that's probably illegal in Southern California in particular, but of course, I have options, Uber. Uh, so what this takes you to is the notion that connecting things to the Internet can bring you great value. GE, one of the initiators of IIC back in 2012, two years before we were performed, uh, estimated that the effect, whatever exactly that means, of the industrial internet would cover about 40% of the global economy and be huge numbers of trillions. Of course, what we mean by effect, who the heck knows. Now, before I go on, there's one other thing we need to look at, and that is risk. Uh, when you connect things to the industrial internet, when you connect things to the internet, I should say, uh, you also enable access uh, by others. Uh, typically, this is the uh, pimply teenager in his mother's basement, uh, is the image that we all get. And of course, there are state actors, just to be more serious about it, who can affect your work, uh, can affect your system. They can control it. And that brings with it huge risk. And here I'll, I'll borrow a, a line that uh, Claude told me, which I thought was very, uh, very pithy and really captured the idea. If I told you that I could improve your um, uh, efficiency, your productivity of your oil well by 5%, but there was a 0.05% of it going down for a month, what do you think that people would do? Would the uh, managers of that uh, plant say, yeah, it's a good idea? Or would they say, no, thanks? I'm not doing anything. This slide is quite rich, uh, and I'm not going to go through every single one of these boxes. That's silly. What I want to do is to try to get to the point that we have an understanding of what IIC is doing. Uh, back in 2014, when we were formed, we published several frameworks. Uh, the first one was a reference architecture, which is not specific to given verticals, but a generalized article, uh, generalized architecture. Uh, we worked to build a mapping 
to the architecture that the manufacturing folk at Industry 4.0 created. Uh, and then we published a security framework. We published a lot. I'm not going to go through everything. Um, believe me, you don't want to hear it. It's roughly 2,000 pages, I'd say. Uh, the paper is all very well, but what people really care about is deployments. And so what we're trying to do now is to establish relationships with different organizations, SBE uh, can and should be one, they are in fact a liaison of ours, to determine the issues that you have, and then to apply what we call digital transformation enablers to your particular industry. So if you look on the right hand side, top right, it says enablers, underneath it says learning. And in fact, I've expanded that on the, on the main, uh, main plane of the, of the slide. Now, machine learning is something that can be applied in all sorts of areas, uh, healthcare, energy, automotive, and of course, in oil and gas. So can we understand what machine learning can do for you and then work to establish how it is that it works specifically in your area? And then you can look at others of these, OTA over the air updates, uh, augmented reality and virtual reality. Uh, OMG now houses a program called Augmented Reality for Enterprise Association. And then we have uh, expanded the notion of security from the first idea, which was actually quite robust. Uh, but we have now extended it to talk about principles for how you can build your system so that it is trustworthy and reconcile the different aspects of trustworthiness, which include security, which itself includes cyber security and physical security, privacy, reliability, resilience, and safety. And here is one of the big issues. Uh, if you, let's say I, I'm a software engineer, if I go into uh, your plant and say, hey, I, I really need to get this done, we need some more security, the person running the oil well is going to look around and go, well, I have armed guards, I have barbed wire, what on earth are you talking about? I, of course, am talking about cyber security. So there is a conflict there uh, between the use of the language and how people uh, think of it. So IAC is working to um, identify and describe these enablers and then deploy them. So stepping up a level, what we have done is we've gone from our initial view, which is kind of laying out the framework, how does all this work, into thinking specifically about deployments in specific verticals. And we are, of course, interested in particular in the oil and gas vertical. With that, I'll hand back to Claude and we can uh, take any questions that you have. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. The first general question, I guess, starting at a, at a pretty high level is, You've, you've talked a lot over the existence of CIIC to a number of people in different industries. What appear to be the, the challenges in adoption? How do people decide to embark in this direction? What, do they realize the benefits or do you first have to convince people of the benefits? Can you talk about that? Sure. Uh, well, there, there are several things that need to be uh, considered and I've hinted at two of them. Uh, so let me start with the one that I haven't uh, uh, talked about in the past. Uh, that is that they expect to be able to see examples in their industry. Um, Jeffrey Moore in 1995, I think it was, wrote a book called Crossing the Chasm, which talks about going from people who are early adopters of the technology into the mainstream. And he has a standard bell curve there uh, in terms of how many people have adopted it, except there's a big gap. And that big gap uh, comes when you go from the pilots in a particular industry that work and everybody's happy about it. And then you say to another industry, oh, look what we did in manufacturing. You can do the same thing. And what comes back is, well, that's lovely, but that's manufacturing. I don't care. Um, I can't learn anything from what it is that you did with over the air updates in, the ro in this robot driven factory for the kinds of things that I need to do to update software in remote oil wells. I mean, they make, they're different manufacturing. It's not the same. The technology is the same. Of course, it needs to be tailored. Of course, it needs to be applied specifically. Uh, there are, of course, lots of different things that you have to worry about when you're thinking, well, I'll just take one example, connectivity. Uh, connectivity in a remote oil well in the North Sea, let's say, is quite a different matter from thinking about connectivity 
in a factory in the outskirts of a large city. I mean, they're just different. So you have to deal with that. That is an inhibitor to deployments. Uh, second inhibitor is uh, risk. I mentioned this earlier, and I could include on this. Uh, again, you have to be able to think about how is this going to add value and is it worth the risk? The third area that I think is uh, really important is that it is difficult to scale. And it's difficult to scale because, and I'm going to start somewhere slightly different and then end with scale. Um, you might be able to go into a, uh, in, in, into a plant and start talking about what you're going to do with, um, what you're going to do with this system. And you'll immediately find conflicts in vocabulary and emphasis. And I mentioned earlier security. What does it mean to me? What does it mean to a person managing uh, an oil well? They're different. So trying to reconcile those is really quite difficult. And it is possible, of course, you can make it happen and you can demonstrate value. But then the next step is how do you do it at the next installation? The problem is that you, although you've demonstrated the technology and got over the first thing that I worried about, now you have to go through the whole bringing people together to have the same vocabulary, the same understanding, the same so-called IT, information technology, OT, operational technology convergence. How do you bring those two worlds together? So that makes scaling difficult, right? You can do it once, but then you have a lot of effort because it's all involved with getting people to understand and bringing people together and making sure that everyone has the same, uh, same understanding. And that's difficult. And what happens and has happened, and this is uh, a reason why we don't see as many deployments as we might, is that people end up in pilot purgatory. They say, OK, I'm willing to take this risk. I'm willing to do this. I did get value, but it's too expensive to have it all over the place. And that really is another inhibitor that we need to address. One of the things, of course, that ISC is trying to do uh, by uh, demonstrating it and being able to, to crystallize the various elements that you need to be able to bring people together more, uh, more clearly. Thanks, Stefan. <clears throat> so um, being from the oil and gas myself, you spoke about all the challenges in, in different industries and also that you are actually working on solutions uh, to uh, make it more adaptable, uh, not just in the oil and gas industry, I would say across the industries. So um, going forward, do you think uh, the industries would become uh, more ready to adapt IoT uh, in their businesses? Do you reckon that uh, we are around the corner to adapt this technology? Uh, well, around the corner is, <laughs> I was going to say yes, and then explain why, but then as soon as you said around the corner, it's like, oh, hang on, hang on. <laughs> I'm not going there. Um, the reason I want to say yes, and I do actually say yes, uh, is because the opportunity is so great. Um, you know from your own industry, just the data that you can gather just offline, right? You know, gather data from this particular oil well or this refinery or this pipeline and put it on a tape, I don't care, put it on a plane and take it over there and then analyze all those things, how much value you can get. Uh, being able to do that in real time, obviously is going to add a great deal more value and really help you. Uh, so I, I really think that um, the opportunity is huge and therefore people are going to have to take it. When you said around the corner, of course, I, got, I immediately go back to the, the statements I made about risk. You know, you have to persuade people this is a good idea. You have to escape pilot purgatory. You have to find a way to scale. Uh, but then the news this morning uh, might maybe believe that, in fact, it is indeed right around the corner because we are going to have a huge problem in both oil and gas. And so people are going to start thinking about how the heck can I get more out? And they are going to be very desperate to do that. So I, I think the answer is yes. And it might even be around the corner. But again, you know how long it takes both to install technology, but also to install the necessary meatware, right? To get people to understand what it is that you're doing and why and get everyone on the same page.
So we have a couple of questions from Fad Sagir, and, and he's asking about scalability being an issue and pointers as, and, and whether there are pointers that are emerging or best practices on how people can um, budget realistically for their, their IoT projects. And I guess that goes back to what you said earlier about the cost of those projects. Different industries have different thresholds at which suddenly money can get freed up to, to do things. Um, have you heard anything specific in either oil and gas or other natural resources extraction areas? I know IIC is very active in the mining industry. Mm -hmm. for instance, how do people justify what percentage of their revenue or what percentage of their profits needs to be devoted to a completely new initiative like um, IO, industrial IoT to, uh, to to get those programs rolled out? You have to be able to demonstrate it and you have to be able to demonstrate it beginning at small scale. Um, that's, that's the basic plan of attack. When I've been going to conferences, I've heard people talk about proof of concepts until the cows come home. Yeah. And the problem is, so so how do people go from saying I've done this proof of concept to I'm able to convince my board to invest tens of millions of dollars, if not more, into a real program? Okay, you can't. Uh, that's the short answer. What you have to do is to uh, get them to take the next step. So let me begin uh, by... Um, saying something that is perfectly obvious to you, but is not obvious to your uh, average software person. Um, large companies, you know, British Petroleum, for example, uh, Rosneft, Gazprom, uh, they make large bets over the decades. That's in the that's in the culture in the boardroom, right? So that's your tens of millions of dollars, but you can't do that off the bat. What you have to be able to do is to go from a pilot to scale that same pilot to another place so that you deal with the human issues and then go take the next small project and make that happen, preferably with uh, the same uh, people because you don't have you don't want to go through uh, sorting out uh, their expectations and needs at the same time. So what you want is a plan over the next few years that contains several relatively small projects, each of which uh, adds value each of which can be scaled, which involves taking it to another installation and working with the people there, which is very costly, but it, you, it can be done. And then to evaluate what worked and what didn't, what added the most value and what did not. And then take the small projects that you have identified that you think can help, reprioritize and do it all over again. So it's not a step from proof of concept to tens of millions of dollars. It's proof of concept to scaling it in a particular installation, to scaling the same one in another installation, to taking another project in another area and making that work and doing it incrementally over time. Because this is gonna sound a little bit weird, uh, but we don't know what we're doing, right? When I say machine learning, for example, that's quite different today from what it was even five years ago. Um, the kinds of things that people can do because the technology moves quickly. So we need to be able to learn as much as we can, as steadily as we can, and disseminate it into the company as far as we can. But we can't do that in one huge step. Does that make sense? It does. And it actually ties to a question that just came in from Robert Doe. Robert asked, what is the single most important ingredient of success? in IoT, especially thinking of the oil and gas industry or for that matter, any industry. So he's talking about, you know, success factors. I, I think that this actually applies to all industries, uh, but I think it's recognition of risk at the board level. Because unless you have that degree of uh, certainty that this is something that you really want to be able to do, then it's not going to happen. Uh, if, if you just say, well, yeah, there are these risks and some middle manager says, okay, and then it goes horribly wrong, you're dead. Um, I, I told you that I, my, my degree is from the UK, that's where I grew up, obviously. Um, and there, genetically modified foods are anathema. There's no reason for it, it's just that it went wrong. And, uh, you know, people, the, the culture got the idea that these were dangerous. And despite all the evidence, that's it. That's it. It's done. You're never going to do it again. 
So you really do need to make sure this is understood right at the very top and then start small, right? Even though you're talking to the, the board and so on and so forth, you, you need to get that and then you can start small. Does that make sense? It definitely does. Um, so uh, following to that, um, we spoke about adaptation and uh, challenges and, uh, you know, the single most uh, in best ingredient to adapt this. But how do local telecom regulations, you know, uh, affect the adaptation as mm -hmm. such? Because different countries have different regulations and uh, different legalities. Uh, it's an extraordinarily complicated area. Um, and the answer is it affects uh, everything. Um, we just, we were talking about the news a moment ago. Um, Russia insists that all data be stored in Russia. Okay, so how now are you going to compare that to an oil well in the Torres Strait? Uh, <laughs> now you're in trouble, right? Uh, so basically the questions of data sovereignty, jurisdiction, where you store it, how you transmit it, who owns it, all of these things are just a great big ball of complications. It is extraordinarily difficult. Uh, the only way to deal with it is case by case. As far as I can see so far, I know there has been some work um, in trying to uh, think more clearly about data sovereignty. I believe actually that Object Management Group has done something. You might know something more about that, Claude. Uh, there is uh, a... Um, an organization in Australia, they have been looking at it. Uh, and that might be a way in which you can uh, begin to get a feel for uh, the kinds of issues that you have. But I would be amazed if anyone thought that this was uh, a, um, that this is a problem that had been solved. I found the name of the association. It's IoT Australia Association. It's based uh, in Sydney at the University of Technology, Sydney. Uh, from the political slash uh, jurisdictional standpoint, you're absolutely right. I think that, that data sovereignty and data residency is an issue. You you correctly quoted Russia, but there's many other countries. Uh, okay. I know Malaysia in particular, where uh, you cannot export the data. Um, you referred to OMG having done something. Yes, there is a data residency paper that was written by the cloud working group at the object management group. And I was the principal author of it. And okay. it's from about uh, four, four to five years ago. So if people okay. are interested, uh, they can look it up. At the technology level of telecommunications, have you seen um, innovative stuff going on in, I don't know, in mining or in uh, electricity distribution or whatever, where people are implementing novel ways to overcome connectivity challenges? Uh, yes, um, but more generally, this is um, referred to as edge computing or distributed computing. Um, back in the day, people used to think about, here's my plant, it's over here, I've got data. And then I send it to the data center, although they usually say I send it to the cloud, right? And the, um, the expectation, the assumption uh, is that that data center is something you know run by Amazon, let's say, or any other providers are available, um, and it is remote from you. Uh, over time, people realized, of course, that that exposed their data more than they wanted, and so they started building their own um, data centers uh, using the various technologies that we associate with the cloud, such as virtualization, uh, being able to um, uh, move uh, computing from one, data from one place to another. Uh, and that was sometimes housed on premise and it was sometimes uh, not, uh, but it was private. And that, that, that makes perfect sense. But the trouble is that that distinction between here are the sensors and the actuators and here's the data center doesn't allow for questions like bandwidth, latency, so on and so forth. So what you might instead want to do is to have some computers, let's say a very local quotes data center, which is very actually quite small, uh, but does a lot of computing work to manage in particular this particular part of this installation. Uh, one area you mentioned mining and energy, 
uh, cloud, but one area where this is quite large is in smart cities, for example. I might have a small uh, server that manages uh, this small, uh, not block, but few blocks, let's say. And then that data needs to be uh, fused with the data that comes from the next block and the next block. So rather than the devices, sensors and actuators, and the data center here, what you want is layers of this. And in that way, what you can do is you can reduce the latency, you can reduce the amount of data that needs to be transmitted, which of course helps you with the bandwidth. And you are also more resilient because if you lose the connection to the big daddy data center up the top, you still need to be able to carry on. An example here, for uh, which is I, th I think quite a common one, so I'll use it, um, is in machine learning where you wish to train the model first and you tend to do that almost all in the data center um, with not necessarily real-time data and then you want actually to deploy uh, the model that has been uh, created locally and you don't want to take all of that to the data center you want it to be local and in general there can be multiple layers uh, one of the things that we're working on at the moment actually is to try to define some patterns for that. Um, when would you want to have something that's very deep with lots of layers? When would you like to have something which is quite broad with fewer layers? When and why and so on and so forth. So it seems that edge computing actually has a huge uh, impact on the feasibility of, of some of these things, that it's, it's really part of the solution in many cases. Uh, someone put in the chat that that can help solve data residency if you can do a lot of the processing of the data locally, um, then you obviate the, um, the prohibitions against moving the data. And that could also be in a situation where you have practically no usable bandwidth capability to connect back to your uh, interpretation central location, um, doing, doing as much as you can right next to where you're acquiring the data is also a, sol uh, a potential solution, right? Mm -hmm. Yep, totally agree. For um, the perspective of um, our colleagues in the oil and gas industry, um, would you let us know um, what are the industries that have um, accepted IoT with open arms? Mm -hmm. I think that the IIC's experience is pretty close to um, that in the real world. If you were to go, for, in, in, uh, for instance, to Platform Industry 4.0, they're very focused on manufacturing. Uh, our thing is collaboration and interoperability across different verticals. So I think we have a good representation. I would say that about 40, the, the biggest one, roughly 40%, is manufacturing. That clearly takes a lot uh, of the installations that we see because manufacturing covers all verticals, right? If I'm manufacturing uh, a battery for a car and I'm manufacturing a battery for an energy grid, I don't care, I'm manufacturing it, right? <laughs> Whatever. Uh, so that means that manufacturing is always going to be the largest. Uh, we had expected uh, energy to be the next biggest thing. And in fact, we have a great deal of interest in energy, uh, but energy unfortunately has many um, subsets. Uh, there's oil and gas, there's distributed energy, there's you know the, the classical centralized power station, there's the list, it, the list just goes on. It's very difficult to bring those things together. And then another area that we did expect to be fairly uh, interesting and is, mu is more interesting than I had expected, and that's healthcare. And I don't actually think that that's entirely COVID related. I mean, COVID affects everything, of course. Uh, but uh, the kinds of things that we're looking at, um, for example, in healthcare, um, is gait analysis. Uh, how can you tell uh, whether a person is about to fall? Uh, if there's something that they're doing, which means that their gait is not stable. And this is in particular interest uh, for uh, older people. In fact, this, this was initiated in Japan, which has a rather older population than most other countries. Um, so we're seeing a lot of interest in healthcare. So if I were to rank things as they are today, I would say manufacturing, healthcare, energy, and then I go down to a very small subset of automotive, namely over the air updates. 
um, over the air updates are valuable in all sorts of different areas, uh, but automotive is the one that has the single biggest um, interest in making sure that it works and it works right at the moment. There's also a bit, since you just mentioned automotive, just as a, as a comment, you also have a connection or an integration between automotive and smart cities yes. for obvious reasons. And if you look at some of the tests uh, or the, the pilot projects that have been done in places like Barcelona or Nice, you find that actually data collected by the cars or about the cars can be fed into um, processes to improve how the how the city handles the traffic. So mm -hmm. that, that's, to me, that's a, a very intriguing stuff, very distant from oil and gas in many ways, but um, you know, there's analogies between, between things. For example, yes. in oil and gas, one of the things that people are worried about is asset management. And sometimes mm -hmm. that means, where's my truck? And what, what, what are the tools that are loaded on that truck? And how mm -hmm. far is it from the oil rig? Or where is the boat? And um, there's been even talk about um, monitoring the location of the people, um, mm -hmm. you know, asking them to put on their smartphone something that will help track where they are if there is cell phone reception, in particular for safety, for safety yeah. issues. I, I, I totally agree. And I, this, again, is one of those huge subjects. So let me see if I can just tick off a few things. Uh, first off, yes, Barcelona and uh, Nice. Uh, have been doing uh, quite a lot of work in that area. If you have any contacts there, I'd love a trip to either or both cities. Thank you. <laughs> uh, in terms of tracking, um, the uh, news this morning uh, talked about Google Maps uh, showing traffic jams on the border of Ukraine. <laughs> and now traffic jams exiting from Kiev. That's interesting. Uh, take, take another example. Um, uh, as again, I told you, I live in Southern California. There's an enormous number of Teslas around here. It's ridiculous. Uh, and at the same time, what we're talking about in energy distribution is how can we deal with the fluctuations in solar and in wind? Well, one answer is that we've got a whole lot of assets that are running around the, the city that have huge batteries. Right now, that when they're not running around, what do you want to do? You want to fill up those batteries and use up that power. And so that kind of distributed energy versus automotive versus they are all incredibly connected. One interesting question here from the audience is um, about uh, data sovereignty. So uh, we already spoke about that. But um, in the oil and gas industry, even the machine learning models that are developed, are also considered sovereign by the oil and gas companies. Mm -hmm. So um, do you see similar phenomena in the other industries? Uh, yes, I do, uh, and it's an issue. Um, one of the things that we are doing or plan to do, this is not uh, done yet, uh, but if I do have a call actually later today on uh, open collaboration platform uh, that we can use across industries. So think open source but then also think open data uh, because the kind of data that we want to use to train these models is also very big. And the kinds of arguments that you can make for open source apply exactly in this area, right? You can gain more by sharing this data and using the data that other people have and everybody can move ahead more rapidly. Now, of course, there's all sorts of questions about how you set those things up. There's questions about uh, who owns what when, um, that's what my call is about today, because uh, I want to talk to an expert in this area so that we can set it up properly. Uh, but sharing data is something that does add value. Of course, each company has to decide whether it adds value to them. And if not, well, we'll keep it private. I want to talk about security a little bit because it's it's a hugely important thing, obviously. It is sometimes a reason why people are, are, it's at least a pretext sometimes to do nothing. You mentioned earlier uh, in your introduction that the key differentiating factor between older industrial, industrial IoT is the connectivity to the internet. I heard a lot of people at least a few years ago say, is an IoT just a fancy term for SCADA? You, you partially answered that, but can you comment more on the host of issues that connecting to the internet creates for those systems and 
how have people been handling this, uh, not just at the technology level, but also at the, uh, you know, the governance level, things like ITOT convergence and things like that. Okay, uh, another broad question there. The way to think about it, first of all, is that the word security actually is quite a dangerous word. Um, th there are multiple reasons why. Um, in English, to me, that has several meanings. Right away, you can say, do I mean physical security? Do I mean, quote, cyber security, a word I loathe, uh, because it just sounds so clever and it's not actually that that big a deal. I mean, you've got to get it right, obviously, but it's it's not special, right? It's something that needs to be secure. Uh, in German, uh, the word for security actually also means safety, Sicherheit. Uh, so that word means security and privacy. So in English, we have many meanings. In German, it covers several areas. It's a complete nightmare. Um, so uh, we have been working with the concept that we call, and I've mentioned this before, uh, trustworthiness. And uh, we have developed a trustworthiness foundation that was published maybe two, three months ago. You can find it on our website, iiconsortium.org. Uh, and then when you take a look at that, what you'll see is a set of a dozen or so principles that you can use to help you reconcile the different parts that make up trustworthiness. So um, I don't want to ask you to go back to the uh, slide that I showed you, but if you recall at the bottom of the slide, I had security, privacy, reliability, a bunch of other words. Uh, they together make up trustworthiness. But the trouble is that they conflict and they conflict also in particular in ITOT convergence. So I used the example earlier of what, what does it mean when I say security? Well, okay, how do we make things secure? Well, I can lock everything up. Okay, that's great. But we also need to be sure that we're safe. I don't want to be looking for the key when there's a fire. So you have to find a way that you can get out, and not let people in. And of course, we solved that problem decades ago, right? You just have those push bars on the doors and that's it. But then, of course, a errant employee can let someone in, right? Because they can open the door, not to go out, but to let someone in. So you have to find a way to deal with that too. And the list goes on. Um, so trying to find ways to reconcile these are quite important. And that Trustworthiness Foundation outlines several principles that you can use to help you uh, get to the point that you can understand how to weigh one thing against another. One last small comment on that related to IT, OT convergence, uh, of course, is that the IT people have a different set of ideas about what's important than the OT people, and they need to be reconciled. And this is especially important in this area um, to reconcile the different parts of trustworthiness. It's also important um, to understand it in reference to um, uh, updates of software. Uh, I have my phone here. I mean, everyone has their phone everywhere, right? It could easily have updated itself three times in the time that we've been talking. You don't do that in an industrial application. You have compliance, you have safety checks, you have all sorts of regulations that you need to follow and so on and so forth. So that needs to be addressed as well. Before we end the session, um, I'm sure you have answered this in multiple questions, but there are many companies who are keen to adapt IIoT technologies. So um, for such companies, um, what would your advice be in terms of steps that should be taken uh, uh, to accelerate the adoption of this technology within the company's operations? You need the champion. Uh, that, that's the first thing. Um, when I mentioned crossing the chasm, um, one of the things that uh, the author points out there is that you have to have someone who's basically willing to stake their career on making this work. Uh, so that's one thing that you need. Uh, the other thing that you need is talent. And one of the big problems uh, that we have uh, is that we don't know what we don't know. Uh, when I was in uh, high school, I remember my uh, geography teacher of all things drawing a circle on the whiteboard and saying, everything inside the circle you know, everything on the circumference of the circle is everything that you know that you, that you, know you don't know. And everything over past the circumference of that circle is stuff you don't know that you don't know. And of course, as the circle gets bigger, 
you, you get more and more uncertain. So what you need to be able to do is to find the right talent. And a way to do that is to try to characterize the system that you're thinking of. Um, how many sensors and actuators are there? Uh, what are the data rates? How much data are, is it? Uh, what is the latency that's required? And so on and so forth. And IRC has a little tool at hub, H-U-B, dot ii consortium dot org called the project explorer that allows you to characterize the system that you're looking at and its intent actually as as all the authors of that tool are thinking really about uh, what do i need to be able to do to uh, hire the right people and get the right companies request for proposal that kind of stuff um, i believe and I, I haven't actually used it this way because i'm not running a project uh, but I believe it's also a way to help us um, get everyone on the project to come to a common understanding. So if I were to ask Claude, you know, how many sensors are there? And he says, oh, five per installation. <coughs> and I have uh, 10 installations. And I ask, uh, you say, uh, how many uh, there are? And you say 20, and we only have five installations. Well, clearly we have a problem, right? So reconcile everyone's understanding helps us go together, which is a big issue that I've mentioned several times before. And it also helps us understand what we don't know because, well, did I actually think about where I need to put my machine learning? How close does it need to be to the plant, to the installation, or how close does it need to be to the data center? I don't know. So what do I need to do to figure that out? We're uh, coming to the end uh, and uh based on the, the flow of questions and answers do you have any final words of wisdom that you would like to share i suppose the uh, uh selfishly uh one of the things that iic is looking for is to be able to find projects uh, that need uh, help in bringing the necessary resources and the necessary expertise to bear um earlier uh, claude you mentioned uh, knowing where your assets are, uh, boats. We actually have a very small company, it's really a two-man company, uh, that is interested in tracking boats. I mean, because like cars, they spend a lot of time uh, not being used. And then, of course, you'd like to be able to uh, allow other people to use them, perhaps kind of like the Airbnb and so on and so forth. And this particular company is interested in uh, using IIoT to enable an application that helps tracking the various marine assets, including certifications of professionals, of the boat itself, of who's used it, how long, you know, all that happy stuff. Um, so if you have any projects uh, that you think can be of interest, uh, then uh, bringing those to IIC, we have a lot of experts, a lot of technology experts uh, who can work on that. That's my selfish answer, join IIC. Um, the less selfish answer, uh, is that I think that this is a technology that is a set of technologies, to be more accurate, um, a technology that has been proven, that is out there in the real world. It is improving, of course. It's always going up and up and up. It is technology that has been deployed, and you don't have to deploy the latest technology. You can deploy something which has been in use for five or ten years and get value. And I think in particular in the oil and gas industry, especially with the news that we had today, it's a great opportunity to bring in uh, upper management to help them understand that you can help them solve their problem and for that matter my problem because i need energy i need heat thank you thank you stephen we were pleased to have today stephen meller cto of the industry iot consortium uh, to talk about advances in the industrial uh, internet of things uh, thank you very much uh, stephen and thank you all for attending have a good day or good evening or whatever rest of the day it is in your location. Goodbye.